sure you work less. And um, yeah, so and um, uh, Keynes kind of, you know, Keynes kind of, uh, you know, did some simple extrapolations giving hours, given the hours decline that he saw over the first kind of 20 years. He was only looking at male manufacturing workers, but um, he was saying, yeah, in the future, we're all going to work 15 hours a week. That's a full time job. Then we're going to have to entertain ourselves. Um, so the more recently, this there's this excellent paper by Bopart and Cressel in the JPE that um, it generalizes the balanced growth preferences that we teach in macro to have a downward trend in hours. And so if you're like me, you went to grad school and you learned the, uh, um, uh, I was saying King, Plosser and Rebello um, are kind of like, you know, the log, log utility specification. And, you know, over time, the hours are totally constant. And so Bopart and Cressel basically build a generalized version that have income effects in labor supply kind of everywhere dominating substitution effects. And so as you get, you know, as the wage rises in this economy that, you know, you, uh, households end up working um, fewer hours. And now that that's a, the, it's a theoretical paper. Um, it's actually, it's, it may sound easy. It's actually hard to, it's hard to come up with preferences that, that are more general, but also give balanced growth. Um, and so what one could do, but, but I'll just say again, Bopart and Cressel don't advocate this, is you could calibrate the strength of income effects to match like the graph we saw on the previous slide. So, so hours decline over time, hours decline the cross section of country, you could say, hey, let's read the preferences off of, off of that. Um, so should we, should we do that? Well, I, maybe, uh, maybe, but like there's, there's kind of like, this paper is about like the you know, three or four other either obvious or I think somewhat obvious challenges to this story that just say, hey, there's other stuff in the world besides tastes. It isn't just that you see something in reality you say, oh, that must be tastes. Um, so there's a, something else that's, that's like a first order thing, which is also changing with development on average, which is the size of tax and transfer systems that countries um, have. Um, and so while there's lots of variation here, it's, it's kind of well known that tax and transfer systems get um, expand as countries get richer. This is a, a graphic from um, some data from the World Bank and, and an AR paper by Eggers et al. that looks at, um, that looks at tax, tax rates on labor income around the world. And, and so this red line here is tax revenues relative to GDP. You know, the poorest countries kind of 15%, rises up to kind of 35% in the richest countries. And, um, and then social benefits as a, as a percent of GDP. That's not our word, that's like a World Bank word. So that's, that's things that are like transfers rather than things like aircraft carriers and roads that the government spends the money. And so those are, you know, surprise, surprise, if you take more income from people, you hand more money back to people. But so these are kind of clearly, you know, th think about the, you're talking about income effects. Suppose I hand you, you know, I'm the government, I hand you a bunch of income for no reason at all. What's that going to do to your labor supply? It's going to lower it, you know. And so transfers are going to lower lower people's incentive to work. Uh, what about if I distort your um, your labor supply margin? That's going to cause you to work fewer hours. So this is kind of just like you know, it's hard to ignore this and say, oh, you know, it's looking at preferences. We have to think about the rise of tax and transfers. Um, another thing that's a little bit more subtle um, in our paper with Alex and 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 Nicola that's just the kind of the facts paper. We looked at hours and wages at the individual level, meaning take data from one country, you know, like the United States, look at how hours vary um, by the wage of the individual, call that the hours wage gradient. In many countries, especially richer countries, these actually have positive slopes, meaning that the higher your wage is, on average, the more hours you'd work. And if that's true, it's not really obvious how we're going to square that with a with an income effect. And so, to give you just a little bit more about what this what this means, so just take the following descriptive regression. Just not we're not trying to do causal inference here. We're just saying let's describe the data. So you've got some cross-sectional data. You take the log of hours, regress it on the log of wage plus a constant and a and a little quadratic in age. This is what actually a number of people have done before us, like. Dora Costa, a historian at UCLA. Um, and we run this regression for every one of those countries we showed you on the previous graph. <clears throat> and, um, 
and we pull off this beta thing, which describes if like, you know, you get a 10% increase in wages by what percent do your hours increase? So here's a graph that plots these betas for all the countries I just showed you before. So this is saying, how do hours adjust within countries when wages rise? And for most of the world income distribution, the answer is they fall. So that sounds like an income effect, a negative elasticity, the poor people work more hours. But you come over here to the rich part of the income distribution and say, huh, it doesn't sound like an income effect anymore. In England, the US, um, I don't know if Australia is here. Austria, I think is AUT, Belgium, Switzerland. You see positive slopes. You know, and they're not huge, but they're, they're, they're not negative. Um, and so that's, um, that's kind of another thing that we, we have to square with an income effect. Finally, if you want to think about income effects, um, you have to reconcile them with the extensive and intensive margins of labor supply. And so I'll just show you some pictures. These, these behave very, you know, very differently across the development respective spectrum. This is the employment rate um, plotted against GDP per capita. This is from my paper with Alex and Nicola. And so if you see sub-Saharan African countries, basically, plus Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, these low-income countries, you know, very, very high employment rates. That's true for men, that's true for women. You see a pretty big fall as you get into the middle of the income distribution. And again, there's a lot of variance here. And then if anything, you see an uptick as you get into the richer and richer countries. Um, Switzerland and the US, um, Netherlands, Denmark, these guys, you know, these guys work more hours than, than these kind of Eastern European countries, if you will. Um, if you're Can wondering- uh, absolutely, yeah. All right, David, just a quick question. How do you deal with uh, black market work, especially in the poorer countries? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. So basically all of the surveys that we use, we, you know, we, we didn't run any of these surveys. We were, we were magpies, you know, going to this website and that website, pulling off, you know, the, all the surveys that somebody else had done. So we insisted only at using surveys where they basically ask questions about all type of work, including, um, including self-employment and agriculture and for family businesses. And so that's, you know, that's not black market in the sense that it's illegal, but you know, these guys aren't paying taxes. They're not registered. They're not, they're not employees. And so like, if you take, you know, the African countries here, the typical, the typical survey would ask people three questions. They would say, did you do any work at all in the last week that's in self-employed agriculture, including taking care of livestock? Yes or no? Okay, and then once they answer that, they'd say, did you do any work in the last week that was self-employed non-agricultural business? Yes or no? And they'd say, did you do any work in the last week that's, any, that's uh, for wages? Yes or no? And then they'd ask individually about those three jobs. And in, in our paper, we add those things up. And so that has the advantage of, of, I think, being clear to the respondent about what, what's actually being asked about. But then it doesn't get into this stuff about, are you registered? Did you pay your taxes last year? It just asks factually about what you did. And, um, and so we, we, you know, we, we basically think that that's, you know, that most people in these countries, you know, wouldn't feel guilty about being subsistence farmers. They don't view that as, you know, as illegal activity. But if there's people smuggling drugs and stuff, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're, in no country are we going to kind of get those guys. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question, and at least in part. Okay, thank you. Just, yeah, just on that point, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I've currently got this issue with a reviewer because we're looking at um, employment in Cambodia, and the, and the reviewer is saying, well, you know, employment includes unpaid um, family work in the definition of employment. So I, I'm guessing that's not included in definitions in, you know, high income countries. So, I mean, perhaps that's an issue in terms of, um, comparing employment rates across countries. Unpaid, so we include unpaid. Um, yeah. Unpaid are, yeah, you kind of have to include unpaid if you're looking at the low income guys, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Was your, Which, was potentially your why you've got high, high rates of employment in these countries, right? Oh, totally, yeah. No, if you, if you insisted on only having wage workers, this number would be down here or something like that. Yeah, so totally, um, yeah. So David, a quick question about the last graph, right? This I mean, one right here? Is, um, yeah. No, the intensive margin. The intensive margin, I haven't shown you yet. Do you mean the uh, yeah. wage elastic? So the backward, yeah, the backward bending one, like, yeah. Yeah, this, this one. one right here? Yeah, yeah okay, exactly. yeah. Right, so this, I mean, this is textbook economics, right? I mean, as you, you know, get more income, your 
leisure stops being an inferior commodity. And we know that in richer countries, people st- leisure at the end of the day is a luxury good. And you, in richer countries, they spend more on luxury goods, right? So as you go up the way, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, keep going. I, um, why is it so, textbook though? The, the, like the, in these guys where this is a negative slope, that means the, yeah. the higher income, let's take Vietnam, the higher wage Vietnamese people end up working less hours than the low income Vietnamese people. Mm. Whereas if you go to the UK, the high income UK, you know, the high wa- think about people earning high wages, they're all in London. Mm. You go to London, people are, you know, stop for a beer late at night because they've been working long hours. So that's, mm. so I guess I'm, I'm open, but why is that textbook? Because I mean, the way I see this graph is basically, I mean, if you remove those, like in, in my view, some outliers, then you get like this backward bending curve, don't you? If I... You mean backward bending in the sense that it's kind of flat and it slopes up? Yeah, so it, it's upward sloping and then it basically goes back up to a negative slope or to a vertical line, maybe. Yeah, it could be. But but so the vertical line here would mean that the elasticities as you get higher, the elasticities are positive but not increasing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so you have a model in your head and I'm, I'm going to write down a model that's my view okay. of things. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm not saying you're wrong. It's more just um, like when I show you my model, why don't you come in and at that point you can say, yeah. here's my model and we can talk about different different models. Yeah, sure. So yeah, this was employment. Let me let me show you just to kind of to complete the facts part and then I'll get to get to the model actually. The, this is the uh, average weekly hours per worker. And per worker here, just to clear, I mean anyone who's employed. So th- this is not per wage worker. Somebody just anyone per word. So this is the this is the intention margin that I was referring to. And I remember when we were putting this graph together, I kept thinking something was wrong. Um, it just kind of seemed crazy that you've got like some of the poorest places on planet Earth, and you look at how many hours they're working, conditional on working, and it was low. Um, you know, it's like as low as the Netherlands, where there's tons of transfers and um, you know, they're very rich. But, but this seems to be true for men. This seems to be true for women. This is uh, true for people who are under 25. It's true for people who are 25 to 54. So call that the prime age, true for, pe- true for people over in the 50. So we, we kind of cut this a number of ways and this, this was in the data. It's true for service workers, true for manufacturing workers. So there's something going on here where there's kind of a hump shape here where there's you know, I, I don't know, you could stare at this and see a hump, you could stare and see, hey, I don't really see much difference between the poorest and the middle, but it's hard not to see a decline as you get into the richer countries. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, you see poorest parts of Europe, richest parts of Europe, you know, this part is kind of clearly downward sloping. So that, you know, I, I just, you know, suppose you think the only thing in the data is the income effect. What's your answer for why these people in these extremely poor countries are not, you know, why don't they get off their butts and work 50 hours a week if they're so, you know, there's such a big income effect. Now, in reality, there's probably lots of reasons why they they don't work that many hours. And in our paper, we're going to think about kind of one or two of them. And they all boil down to this last kind of challenge that I'm going to raise and that's going to feature in this paper, which is that the subsistence self-employment, you know, rate declines with GDP per capita. And kind of this is well known. I'm not going to show a picture about this, but you know, basically, you um, think about subsistence self-employment. You know, there's a number of things that 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 kind of feature in in subsistence self-employment. One is you're probably not commuting a long ways to some job. You know, you're probably working at or near your house. If it's agriculture, you, you know, you're you're you probably have little little in the way of a fixed cost of work. You could probably walk right outside and start working. And so that's like, you know, maybe a reason why employment rates are so high and maybe a reason why you have low hours conditional on employment. You know, you can have your grandma go out and weed for a little bit, come back in. And that's part of the part of the story. On the other hand, there's some evidence that I'll talk about later that, that, you, that people in real low income countries may be kind of constrained on how many hours they can work productively. Uh, not legally, just in the sense that, you know, if you're a subsistence farmer, you got a small amount of land and little or no livestock. It may just not be real productive for you to get out and, and, and have 16 hours a day of work. It may be after four, five, six hours, you've kind of run out of things to do. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that in, in so that evidence a little bit later. But basically, if we put all these things together, we have kind of, um, 
you know, a number of direct alternative stories about why, or at least one main one, which is taxes and transfers. You know, the other thing too about subsistence self-employment is you, as you get richer and richer and you, and you move out of kind of family farming and into the wage sector, if you think, if you think that there's a kind of a fixed cost of working, which much of this literature on, on labor supply, you know, um, posits, you're kind of moving out of family farm where there's very little fixed cost of work and in, into wage sectors where there, where there is um, fixed cost of work. And so this subsistence of self-employment channel, this tax and transfer channel, the, these are kind of key alternative stories. And then there's these facts on the table that you know, there aren't obvious how to square with an income effect. And so what we're gonna do in this paper- uh, And David, do you mind if yeah. I uh, throw a quick question here? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I, I've been thinking, is this something happened um, in the, within the family here? So you've yeah. been talking about individual income and the individual work hours. Yeah. Um, I wonder, is this any uh, changes in the family structure? You know, in the old times, maybe you have a family where you have only one income earner, you know, maybe a husband, yeah. work, but uh, wife stay home and look after kids. But yeah. move on, you know, they change and then it getting more and more popular that both uh, partner has to work. And then yeah. if their objective is to maximize the family income instead of the um, individual income, then you have this, uh, you know, um, externality coming from, yeah. you know, your partner's decision and yeah. that will affect your decision as well. So Simon, we're going to have so that we're going to have exactly that story in, in our model to explain how you move from kind of the middle to the rich countries. Right. Um, so we're going to have a very crude way of capturing that. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why when you, you know, let's say you move from a country at the level of Latin America to Western Europe, you know, you may have women entering the labor force. We're not going to have any of those things model. We're going to have this real simple thing. We're going to say a fixed cost of work is going to kind of decline over that part of the income spectrum. Mm -hmm. We're going to have mm -hmm. almost the opposite, though, to explain how you go from sub-Saharan Africa to the middle of the income distribution. So sub-Saharan Africa, you have a family farm. You know, what's the cost of having everyone in your household work? Hey, you just walk outside and do a little work, no problem. As you move into kind of the middle of the income distribution, you're much more in kind of wage work. And in wage work, you have a fixed cost. So it's much harder to have two, two different people go out and work. And so then you're gonna have, you're gonna, you have more likely to have one of the people stay home and just have one work. So we're, so, so, so that's a, a long-winded answer. So what you're saying is gonna feature prominently in, the, in what we're gonna say today. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this paper, the rest of the paper anyways, is, a, is, gonna, is gonna, I mean, I've tried to highlight already where we're going. Um, so, but we're going to build a model to formulate, formulate these kind of ideas. And we're going to have the literature's preferences where income effects do not equal substitution effects in labor supply. So we're going to allow for that channel. And then, you know, give, give me a slide and I'll give you more on the model, but we're going to have enough individual heterogeneity in the model to match the, the facts that I showed you on the previous slides. So we're, so we're going to, we're going to have the model match the, the kind of convex pattern in employment rates. And we're going to have them all match the, um, you know, the hump, the hump shape in um, in the intensive margin hours per worker, and the subsistence self-employment decline with um, with GDP and the within country elasticities. And so then, basically, we're also going to have, and part of the way in matching all these facts, we're going to we're going to have country-specific tax and transfer systems. And that's going to be totally exogenous. We're just going to feed in in Africa. You know, there's very little taxes, very little transfers. In Germany, there's lots of taxes, lots of transfers. And so this model is going to kind of be equipped with a number of, a number of bells and whistles that, that in principle could explain the patterns we, we showed you and, and the decline in adders. And then we're going to calibrate the model to match the patterns, like I said. Um, and we're going to then do some decomposition exercises to try to learn about the determinants of um, labor supply. And we've been, yeah, we've been, we're still working on this, um, but I, hopefully I'm going to have enough insight today about where these patterns are that, that there's still something to learn. We're, we're still working on other kind of, other kind of um, decompositions. And so what we're going to conclude today, so if you, if you want to have like a headline number, the number is 60%, and I didn't put this here because I'm not sure we want to, you know, sell that number exactly yet, but income effects 
this kind of preference story. In our, in our paper, we're gonna explain about 60% of the overall decline in hours. And um, so that's kind of most of it. So we still think this is mostly an income effect. Structural change is, is gonna be kind of what takes you most of the rest of the way there. So the fact that we're moving off of family farms where kind of anyone can work and into economies based on wage work where you gotta commute, you know, you gotta have work clothes. Um, these things are gonna keep people, you know, on the, in the household, they're gonna keep people out of, out of work, um, out of the labor market. And that's, and that's gonna lead to a decline in hours. That's gonna explain most of the rest. Taxes and transfers are gonna play a, a, a much smaller role than we were expecting. Um, structural change is gonna be really crucial to think about why intensive and extensive margins look so different. Taxes and transfers are gonna be really important to understand why um, the graph that Tushar was asking me about, you've got negative slopes in the poorest countries, positive slopes in the richer countries. Um, taxes, without taxes and transfers, you got, in our model anyways, no way to, ex to explain that. Um, and so that's kind of the, the paper in a, in a nutshell. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hopefully make this clear as I go through. Um, okay, so now um, let me show you the model. And um, so I'll just give you one slide on the summary of what's going on here. We're gonna have different households. Simon was saying, what about within household stuff? Yeah, we're gonna have a within household problem here. It's gonna abstract from a lot of the rich things that you know make a household a household, but it's gonna have enough to have a notion of an intensive and extensive margin, which is kind of enough for us. It's a static model. Um, and I'm kind of somewhat apologetic about that, but mostly I think this is just like a paper about lifetime labor supply. It's not like a paper about whether you take this week off or you take a long vac vacation over the summer. You know, it's like, you know, in France, you know, it's a good life. You have a long summer, you retire early, you start working late. Um, that's just kind of like lower hours. Um, we're gonna have these McCurdy preferences. So if this doesn't mean anything for you, you'll, you'll recognize them probably when I show you the preferences. That turns out to be a special case of these general Bopart Cressel prefer preferences I showed before. And um, we're gonna have two sectors because if we wanna think about structural change out of self-employment, we actually have to model self-employment. Uh, so we will. The traditional sector is gonna be kind of subsistence self-employment. The modern sector is gonna be um, wage work. And there's gonna be a number of differences, but the key kind of difference here that I'll mention now is that the modern sector has a fixed cost of work because you like have to commute and you know go find your way to a, a job. Maybe you have to find the job, maybe there's like search costs. We're not really gonna model that explicitly. We're just gonna say there's a fixed cost. And then there's gonna be nonlinear labor taxes. The fact that they're nonlinear probably isn't all that important, but we're gonna to try to have a realistic tax system. So we're gonna make them nonlinear. There's gonna be consumption taxes and transfers to people. Um, so that's how things are gonna work. So, uh, sorry, uh, David. So the uh, fertility is going to be, you know, absorbed in your face cost, that kind of thing? You know, I, I, I kind of don't, I, maybe. Uh, I think in low income countries, the story that I hear is that if you're on a family farm, you know, you can kind of multitask. You can do some work in the field and you can have you can have, um, so in our model, there's not gonna be a fixed cost of work in the self-employment sector. And so maybe that's like a family farm, you can have your kids running around and you, um, you, um, you tend the crops or something. But yeah, in a rich country, part of the fixed cost is you not only have to commute, you have to get childcare or something like that. So, so if that's what you mean, then yeah, I think the fixed cost probably, you know, probably is, is, um, is there. Yeah, so cause I, the reason I raised this is I think uh, this uh, fertility decline is global and then it's very yeah. significant in the past, you know, it took for the developed countries even very significant for the past century entirely. Yeah. And then that's, uh, I think that's, I don't know how that's gonna play a role in your model, but it's a very significant phenomenon. And then that's yeah, I, a very important in labor supply decisions. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, we have this internal debate among my co-authors about whether we say that explicitly, because our model is going to be one where as countries get richer, the, 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 the estimation that we do, well, let's say calibration, because we don't have standard errors yet, the calibration is going to point to declining fixed costs with development. 
And so I don't know that it, within among my co-authors, I actually say we should say, yeah, that's like because you got fewer kids, you know, and so that's like just like you say, that's a very important thing. Hmm. And I don't know. So other of my co-authors say that's opening a can of worms. We don't know what our fixed cost is. So rather than open a can of worms, let's just be agnostic. But but in my heart of hearts, the reason the fixed cost goes down in richer countries in part is because you got less kids to take care of. I mean, it's just it's very hard to imagine two, you know, two earners both leaving the house every day to work and then you have, you know, six kids or something there. So yeah, I, I kind of, your comment is actually, I'm going to use your comment as ammunition to try to say, probably this is related to fertility. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I could, I could go on all night. Some of this I already said before, let me, I just let me plug one thing. I, one thing that comes up all the time is people say, well, there's regulation of hours. And that's true. You know, there's many countries that regulate days per week, hours per day. Firms get regulated in how they hire people. There's several measures of this that we looked across country. And we didn't really see that being correlated with GDP per capita. Um, there's rich countries that regulate a lot, like France. There's rich countries like the US that, you know, that don't. In Africa, some countries have very strict regulations. Maybe nobody listens to them. I don't know, but they, they do. Others don't. So I, we just didn't really see a lot there. Um, there's home production. You know, in this model, it's going to be pretty simple. Every hour you're not working is home production. You know, I've been home with my kids for a year. I can assure you that home production, you know, if kids, if kids is leisure, then, I, you know, kids should be home production and it's closer to work for me anyways. But we're not going to have that in the model. In, um, in our other paper, we show that home production also declines with GDP per capita. So it's kind of like another, another type of work. We're just not gonna have it in here. Um, so let me keep going then um, with the model structure. So we're gonna have measure one of households and the households are gonna differ in their productivity in the modern sector. And if you wanna think about what this represents is like, you know, this could be like some amalgamation of, of education and, you know, other, other non-education ability. And then we're not gonna kind of think about differences within the household and their productivity. We're just gonna say there's like a professor household and there's like a didn't finish high school household. And there's gonna be some kind of normal distribution here. Um, and then this is just gonna kind of like govern the wage variance and at least in the, in the wage sector. Within each household, there's gonna be measure one of heterogeneous individuals. Another way to do this, which I guess, Simon, you sound like you'd be advocating for is to think about you know, um, the working individuals, the non-working individuals. We're gonna kind of just think about this as, this is like a model of adults. You know, we, don't, we don't literally have labor supply here. We could have had two, we're gonna kind of just make it a heterogeneous because it, it's, it's continuous and easier to solve than to have two. But the idea is, why would we even need heterogeneous individuals in a household? Why wouldn't we just say there's people, you know, they're wandering around. Why do we need households? I mean, one reason is we want an extensive margin here. Suppose you had a model that has you know, just a whole bunch of individuals on their own. You'd never have somebody making a lifetime labor supply decision of zero. You know, what zero income, what's your consumption? Oh, it's also zero. You know, you're never gonna get that. So, so the reason you're gonna get a decision of zero here, it's gonna be like, you know, a couple gets married and one of the one of the two decides not to work. Does that mean that they get no consumption? You know, of course not, because they're within the same household. That's kind of like the idea here. Um, individuals are gonna differ in a fixed disutility of work. And so, you know, I, you know, if you look at different couples and you say, hey, well, you know, person number one in the relationship works, the other one doesn't. Is that because there's a different disutility of work? Probably not, you know, but like we don't have kids in the model. Uh, we don't have differences in ability within the, in the couple. So we're just going to have this simplistic story here where, you know, some people are just going to have a high fixed cost, others are not. And that's going to determine who in the households works. At the individual level, there's going to be these McCurdy preferences. Every individual's consumption, hours, and disutility of work are going to determine their utility. And then there's this CRRA thing in um, consumption. And then there's just this penalty for, for hours of work. So if like you work zero hours, this whole term is, is zero. And then every additional hour you work is more and more costly to you. And this is a standard way of writing this. If you're, if you're into these things, uh, fee is the Frisch elasticity of labor supply, which isn't all that relevant for what we're talking about. It's more of a short run kind of elasticity. 
And then there's this U bar S thing. So this is gonna be a fixed cost of working in sector S. I'll tell you about the sectors in a few slides, but you wanna think about a high fixed cost in the modern sector, zero fixed cost in this traditional self-employment sector. Eta is the individual's distaste for work. And this is just an indicator function for whether you work any hours at all. So you work any hours at all, this fixed cost lights up and then you get punished for the hours that you, you do have. Um, the household's budget constraint. So that's you know at the individual level. At the aggregate level, the household is gonna have consumption that's taxed at this rate, uh, tau C. What they're gonna have in income is, is uh, the labor income that they have from all their members, all the individuals in the household. They're gonna pay taxes. It's going to, I just wrote it like this because it's nonlinear. And then they're just going to get this transfer, this Greek letter gamma. So the government's just going to hand you money. Um, it could be social security. It could be welfare. It could be schools that you get in kind. It's just going to be something that we're going to think of as, as cash. And in the paper, we solved this two-stage problem of a household head. You know, there is no household head. So it's just a kind of a, a fiction, some at atomistic agent in the household. And they're gonna maximize the joint utility of everyone in the household. And this is actually, we're not breaking much ground here. You can find lots of, lots of papers that have this kind of thing. So in the first stage, the household says, look, you know, we know our Z, we know like we're a, a rich professor household or a, or a poor high school, you know, didn't finish high school household. The first thing the household is gonna do is choose. Do we wanna be like a farm family and all be in self-employment? Or do we wanna work in the modern sector and potentially be wage people? And then the household that is gonna choose the hours and the consumption of the household. In the second stage, the household head is gonna say, all right, now that we've decided we're like, I don't know, in the wage sector, we're gonna choose how many hours each individual in the household works and what our consumption is. And the household head, since all the members are treated equally, gives us all equal consumption. And actually in the paper, you can show that it's a pretty simple rule for labor supply here. This model is kind of geared up to just be thinking, do you work at all? If the answer is yes, you all work the same hours, basically. So if you were to look within a household, you'd see basically there's the people that work and the people that work zero hours. That's basically what you get. Quick question, um, David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go to the previous slide. Um, yeah. Yes, out here. So does it matter if you have uh, additive, uh, you know, costs in the sense, you know, minus mu bar s and then minus eta uh, instead of multiplicative. Yeah, I, I, I think that would matter. Um, it's hard to imagine that would, that would not matter. Um, I mean, in that case, what I feel is that if, if you have uh, additive costs, uh, you don't need eta then. You, uh, only I think mu bar s should, should work with you. I mean, I'm just trying to understand why do you need eta? Yeah, the only reason we need it is you need to have some rule inside the household for who would work and who would not work. And so the way this works is like, you know, so suppose in my household, there's me and my wife and my grandma. And, you know, we're all professors. Um, and so the problem is, though, that, you know, grandma you know, has a real high fixed cost of working and me and my wife don't. And so that household maybe says, OK, well, on the extensive margin, we're going to have grandma stay home. Her fixed cost is just too high. And then me and my wife go out and work. Oh, so, so eta, eta varies. Eta is not same for all individuals. Yeah, sorry. You know, I this slide says it differs in fixed utility, but then I didn't write the distribution. So in fact, it it's a it's a um uniform it's a uniform. We we tried other things. It's so it's a uniform. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I thought it's it's fixed. So that's why I was thinking, do you even need eta? That's fine. Got it. Yeah. No, that's right. If it was fixed, it wouldn't really do anything for us. Yeah. If but David, keeping... yeah. So uh, but in the end, this household has all the decision made by this imaginary household head is like a detective yeah. that decide everything. So why is this necessary to have any heterogeneity within the family? I mean, in the end, it's the detector make the decision. The heterogeneity is only because we want an extensive margin. Yeah. Like if you tell me, I don't care about an extensive margin. The only thing yeah. I want you to tell me is how many hours your family works. Then I could throw this all in the garbage basically. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, my understanding is you, you need this to, as you said, explain zero labor. Uh, yeah, yeah, you need, 
you need the zeros. And then right. in a model with static labor supply, so you just pick once and for all for your life, are you going to work or not? And you're on your own. It's not, you, it's not a household. It's just you're, you're a single guy for your whole life. Do you, do you do zero work? You can't really do zero work in the model because there's no, there's kind of, you know, your consumption ends up being kind of zero basically. So this is how you get an extensive margin. And then everybody face, you know, in every country in the world, these are the preferences and these are the various, you know, disutilities across the people. We're going to ask, does the, do, you know, does the structure of the model tell us that this extensive margin should change across? I mean, it does, you know, so that we're going to basically estimate it. So we get that extensive margin pattern we saw in the data. Yeah, but this is, this is all about an extensive margin. Then there's a notion of an intensive margin, which is like, um, you know, given that, like in my example, we decided grandma and my household's not going to work, but then my wife and I are going to work. My wife and I have to decide how much to work. So like what this model I think does well is it's like, as we're richer and richer, well, my wife and I are, we're going to, you know, take longer holidays and all that. We're going to work less. There's something that this model doesn't have, which is there's some households where there's like one full-time person and one part-time person. This model is not geared up to, to do that. It just every, you know, you, you, you have the same fixed cost. If you had two fixed costs, you could get kind of part-time work and stuff like that. But there's kind of already so many bells and whistles here that we, um, we just punted on, on two fixed costs. So it's kind of like a model. Do you work at all? And then conditional on work, how many, how many hours do you work? Uh, uh, Dave? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I mean, but for example, uh, the second stage, is there's any bargain in the household up to allocate consumption in hours? Yeah, they all, everybody gets the same consumption. Yeah. And then um, no, the household head just lines everybody up in the morning and says, you're going to go do this. And then they all just obediently obey this household head. Yeah. How, how would you have me model it? Or you're just- No, 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 I'm just trying to understand the rationality because the way that put the first and the second stage looks like, I mean, the first stage, I mean, we have the whole household consumption, the whole household hours of work. Yeah. And then the second stage, the, 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 the people in the house will do the bargain with each other in order to, to see how they're going to allocate this amount of consumption and hours. Yeah, no, that's not how it works here. Um, okay. You know, like my, my grandma gets to stay home and I have to work, but, you know, but, but that's what grandpa told me. So, you know, I don't know who grandpa is. I didn't, I'm introducing a new, a new person to the household. My analogy keeps changing. Yeah, no, if you, you know, I, you have to think about the family as, as all, as all agreeing to, participate in this thing you know there's, there's some people who aren't going to work i mean in reality if you yeah so basically the individuals are equal but they are z are different and they the eat z are is, different so the z is the same you could have their productivity be different you could alternatively say it's not the household that has the z but the individuals would do that would that would kind of give you the same thing it would just say the least productive members among us stay home and the most productive go to work we had that alternatively and and the algebra worked out ever so slightly worse that with that formulation. Yeah. So there's no bargaining within the households. The household is kind of a, you know, yeah, it is kind of, it's kind of this household that is maximizing joint utility, but, but yeah, there's some people who end up working more than others. So it's not like, you know, it's not like um, at the margin, everybody's utility is literally exactly the same. That's not, that's not true. But there's no way you can pick a different cutoff to to increase the household's joint utility. Yeah. David, this might be trivial, but in some way, ETA is capturing the bargaining as well, right? I mean, you could think of some people who have higher bargaining power; they have a lower ETA or higher ETA, depending on what they prefer. It's possible. Yeah, you say, well, I just have low bargaining power, so they're going to send me out. Um, yeah, that's. That's possible. I mean, that's it's an abstract thing. We're gonna just call it a distaste for work. I, you could you could call it that, I guess. Yeah. So David, um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, so here, I think, uh, given the uh, disutility from uh, working and the fixed cost here, uh, I think yeah. another important uh, prime, uh, another important variable for the uh, decision of the family should be the number of uh, family members, right? Yeah, well, we we've been trying hard to sweep that under the rug, but you're gonna you you've lifted up the rug and brought it out. It it, it turns into a nightmare if you if you try to think about 
family size here too. So we're we're gonna we're not gonna think about that. Yeah. So to the extent that to the extent that um, to the extent that there's big families, and that means that there's you know that 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 means that there's you know that that means that there's more kids. We're just gonna kind of think about that, like I was saying to Simon earlier, as like there's just a big a bigger fixed cost of. You no know, bigger fixed cost. Yeah, yeah, because there's That's a trade-off cool. here if uh, the family size increases, right? So if just only, for example, for big families, the father just need to support them and many kids, yeah. then there could be a lot of the disutility from working for the father. Then the family need to assign additional, uh, an additional family member to work. Uh, in that case, I think uh, that's the reason why I think, uh, I I'm thinking the family size matters here. Uh, yeah, know. I. If you're my referee and you write that, we'll put it in. If a referee doesn't tell me to do that, we're gonna we're gonna punt on that, because it, you, I still have three or four more model slides to go. So th there's other bells and whistles here that we, that in our opinion, were more relevant for what we were doing. But it's it's not to say that family size is irrelevant. It's more just you know of all the modeling choices we made, you know we we focused on other things, which I can hopefully tell you about. Um, but it's a good point. I I I. I agree, that's important. Um, so let me tell you about the two sectors in, in production then. So this household member, first stage, they're gonna decide which sector they wanna to go to. So our sectors here are gonna be defined by the production technology, not the nature of the goods. So there's not like a relative price. It's kind of like the Malthus to Solo paper in the AER from Hansen and Prescott. So this modern sector is competitive. It's got a production function, which is just totally linear. And the, there's pre-tax family income in the modern sector, which is W, that's gonna be the, just the posted wage of, uh, of the modern sector. Z is the number of efficiency units that that household has. So there's like the high Z is the professor one, the low Z is the high school dropout one. So W is the wage per efficiency unit hour, and Z is the efficiency units, H is the hours that the household chooses to work. And so that's the total income. And then this modern sector where you want to have a U bar M, you've you got to commute, you got to get a babysitter, whatever, whatever you need. Uh, the traditional sector, we're going to say, um, like I said before, it's the subsistence self-employment. It's not just going to be a posted wage and self-employment. You work as many hours as you want. It's like the household has their own production function, and this is how much output they're going to get. And so AT is the technology and the um, traditional sector, H is the hours in the traditional sector, and then rho is gonna be this number between zero and one that's gonna govern the degree of decreasing returns to scale in this sector. And I mentioned that a little bit before, but we wanna think about this as a farm family where every additional hour, you know, you've, took, you've taken care of the weeding, you know, you fed the animals. After that, you know, you can water a bit, but you know, it's not like you can do that forever and still be productive. And so that's why we, we have this decreasing returns to scale. Um, on the other hand, there's no fixed cost of working. We could make it a lower fixed cost. We're just gonna go crazy and say it's zero. And then another thing that we're gonna add in because we think it's realistic and we think it's relevant for, for the issue of hours is no taxation of labor income. And so this is um, this is like you know there's a large literature on the informal sector. There's a large literature on looking at the margins of how taxation is lower in, in low income countries. And so in most recent memory, Anders Jensen of the Harvard Kennedy School has a very nice paper that that just shows kind of as you get poorer and poorer, the fraction of people who are exposed to income taxes in any way um, are is is falls. And so this is, we're just gonna say, if you're self-employment, they don't, they don't tax you, but you have no fixed cost. And so these are all kind of channels why this sector is gonna, these are all gonna be relevant for your hours choices. And the modern sector, this fixed cost is gonna be relevant for your hour choices. And the fact that you can work as many hours as the going, at the going wage. So this, these two sectors are gonna be kind of really important for, for hours choices. But David, sorry to um, delay with this point, but I mentioned earlier that, I mean, the ILO um, defines self-employment in developing countries as own account workers and unpaid family workers. So my yeah. point is that like, I think self-employment is defined differently in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. And I think potentially this is an issue. Um, 
so that you might want to look at because uh, I think no, potentially I... it could be driving some of this story here. So if you remove so don't... those unpaid family workers from the definition of self-employment, then I think you might see a slightly different story. I, I totally hear what you're saying. So exactly because of the reasons that you're saying, we did not use one iota of data from the International Labor Organization. Every single one of our surveys, we've measured painfully and anally ourselves how, how we're going to define self-employment and we're going to define these things. So yeah. we, we measure them exactly the same way in rich and poor countries. Yeah, um, but, but I mean, the, the questions in these surveys are based upon ILO classification. So anyway, I'm, I'm just making the point, and Gary Fields makes this point as well, that you should be including these people, unpaid family workers in self-employed definition in lower middle income countries. But I think that's quite different to high income countries. So that's sort of the point. That I'm... I guess I, I'm just think like, so we, I mean, I was the, I didn't just hand them off to an RA. I mean, I kind of did these. So like in our rich countries, if you're an unpaid family worker, you are employed. Um, so, so, so there's another, there's another issue, which, okay. So uh, let me. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I just want to, yeah, just sort of, but I think potentially it's an yeah. issue you want to dig into a bit further. I think it's an, I, I think it's an issue for the ILO data. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue for us though, because we're the ones who decide what to do with the unpaid. I mean, we we don't have aggregate data. We have the surveys ourselves. So I guess I just don't. There's like a question that that you know that says, did you do any work? And did you do any work for unpaid business? If the answer is yes, we count you as employed. Um, yeah, um, in the well, my understanding is, in the case of Cambodia, the yeah. questions on employment are based around the ILO classification. So you have. Employee, you have own account worker, you have unpaid family worker. And I think you'll find all the living standard measurement surveys also adopt those classifications, which are based upon the ILO. So anyway, I'm just, yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, going no, on about it, this but... point, but I think it's key to what you're doing. I think in terms of how you define these sectors and how work is in different yeah. countries, labor markets are different, et cetera, but whether you can compare across countries is, is an issue, I think. Um, in terms of the way in which work is defined in, across different countries. So. Yeah, no, I'll just say again, that's why we didn't, we took our own definitions, which in that other paper, we spent a long time talking, I mean, that other paper is nothing but data. You know, there's not one equation in there from a model. So it's like, we, I mean, I think we earned our spot in print basically by, by dealing with that issue as best as anyone could deal with it. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, shall we hold on to rest of the questions till David finishes the model. Yeah, I, how am I doing on time? I've got 20 minutes, that's about, that's about right. So, um, so I was gonna justify some of the assumptions more, but let me, let me I've, I've been long-winded, so let me, let me keep going. So this is the labor market, um, this is market clearing in the modern sector. So basically there's gonna be, the modern sector is gonna demand some labor, here's the, here's the labor input. Um, and the total labor input is going to be the sum of all of the Z's. So in the modern sector, households have this productivity. This is the hours that they work. And then we're going to add up over all the, all the people who actually chose the modern sector. And the nice thing in this, you know, that this not having capital here, basically, you just say, we'll read the wage off of the modern TFP, which is exogenous at the country level. The government's going to have this balanced budget constraint, which says, gee, that's going to be their government spending. That's going to be like aircraft carriers and roads and stuff, plus gamma, which is the transfers um, that they're going to give out, has to equal the total taxes they collect from these nonlinear labor taxes and then consumption. They're going to tax consumption um, just because we want Basically, we're going to add in this consumption tax, not because we care about consumption taxes, just because we want the government to balance its budget. Okay, so what's going to differ across countries here? So, um, so here's what's going to differ. We're going to have the modern sector TFP differ across countries. We actually have to have some reason why countries are richer than others. Um, like if we want to have income effects, we actually have to have some governing thing to um, govern people's you know, weight, wages and productive and income levels. We're going to have traditional sector productivity increase. We think that there's evidence. I'm thinking like the Caselli and Coleman AER paper from 2006, but I could name other ones. We, we think there's evidence that there's skill bias 
technology differences across countries in the same way that in many advanced countries, there's been skill bias technological change over time. They're saying in the cross section of countries, there's skill, skill bias. And that, you know, skill here is if you think about that Z as skill, that's gonna say this modern technology is gonna rise faster than the traditional technology across countries. And that's gonna be the main impetus about why in this model, everybody, you know, is gonna move out of the traditional sector and into the modern sector with development. It's just because that sector's TFP is gonna, or labor productivity, I should say, is gonna go up faster. Countries are gonna differ in uh, their tax and transfer system, which is gonna consist of a tax rate on consumption, a full nonlinear labor tax schedule, although this really isn't all that important. Frankly, we could just have tau N you know, on labor, and then the transfer, the size of the transfer that they give out to people. You know, there's all sorts of you know stuff you could talk about about you know how the transfers play out across the income distribution. We're 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 actually doing kind of what the frontier of this literature is, which is is pretty crude, which is just everybody gets this transfer. Um, so this is some old age support, although we don't have that. It's schools. It's I don't know, medical care, something like that. And it's kind of just the same for everybody. Um, finally, there's this fixed cost of working in the modern sector, where it's going to allow it to differ. Um, you know, it's like what Simon said earlier, you know, there's the lower fixed costs in richer countries. Well, he didn't say this, but I guess I'll say it. Lower, lower rich costs, lower fixed costs in rich countries because um, um, there's fewer kids to take care of. Maybe cities have, are less congested. There's less commuting costs. Actually, I, there's some evidence we cite in the paper that commuting costs are actually lower. But these are the kind of the things that differ across countries. Okay, so to... to I don't know what this means, bringing the model to the data. Eventually, we're going to estimate this. We're, we're just going to kind of calibrate stuff now. Um, basically, I'm going to skip over this quickly. There's, there's data on labor tax rates from this Egger et al. paper. And they basically, they basically have like a, the equivalent of tax sim in the US, where you enter in an, an amount of income, and they tell you how much labor income you'd pay on average if you were that income level. And they basically do this for every percentile of the income distribution. For a whole bunch of different countries. And so we basically take this Benabu, you know, this kind of tax function for, you know, if you say, so the, the Benabu defines the net income that you get from labor at work, which is like by definition the gross income minus the tax you pay. Benabu parameterizes it with two Greek letters. And kind of lambda, if you will, is like the average tax rate. And tau is kind of like the progressivity of taxes. So if you're not following this completely, you can just ignore this and just imagine that I have like a different average tax rate. This tau, this progressivity thing, we put it in, we were excited. It, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So I'm gonna vote to get rid of it then because it's an additional complication. Um, and we're gonna set Lambda basically, we're gonna target a bunch of stuff. We're gonna target the average level of taxes and then we're gonna pick Lambda to get the share of all government revenues that come from labor income taxes. Um, I don't know, the right hand, the y axis may not mean much, just you can look at kind of the, the trend is that progressivity is actually higher in richer countries, so tax are more progressive. And then this is of all the revenues that the government get in poor countries, very little comes from labor income. As you get richer and richer, more, more comes from labor income. None of this is new to us. This, these are, um, these are uh, show up in other, many other data sets. Um, Okay, so taking the model to the data um, in terms of consumption, taxes, and redistribution. So what we're going to do basically is we're going to, um, you know, we have this labor income tax that kind of comes straight from the data. We've got consumption tax, and and we're going to kind of just stick in whatever consumption tax is needed to actually get up to this data right here, this red line, which is the fraction of all GDP, fract tax tax revenues relative to GDP. Um, and then the, um, the blue line is going to be the transfers that we hand out to everybody. So richer and richer countries are going to get bigger and bigger transfers. And then the gap between the red and the blue line um, is, um, is going to be this consumption. And we're just going to, I don't know what to do with government consumption. You know, what does a battleship do for you? What does a road do for you? It probably does something. We're going to do what other people do here, which is we're just going to throw it away, basically. So that people get these transfers, they don't get the the government consumption that that just gets thrown away. Okay, so this so this model basically 
So we're going to calibrate the model to match a bunch of different features of the average poor country and the average rich country. And so we're going to match employment rates for the two countries. So much higher employment and low income than, than high income. We're going to match the fraction of workers in the traditional sector. So it's also much higher in the poor country than the rich. And we're going to, maver we're going to match average hours per worker. So we're going to match that extensive margin too. Finally, we're going to match output per adult. This is like you know, the income levels across these countries. Um, we're not going to target the middle income countries. That's we're going to, it's going to be kind of one smell check on whether this makes sense. We're not going to target at all the wind within country elasticities. Um, and there's other things we're not going to target that I, that I substantiate. Um, the, the last thing we're going to target or sorry, actually, we're not going to target, but we're going to, we're going to compute and compare against the data is this, the traditional sector hours, which we're going to measure in the data is self-employed individuals with low education uh, and modern sector hours, which we're going to have as all other working individuals, their hours. So this is Michael, where I think I was, I was, I was not giving an inch before when you were making the points that you're making here, I'm going to give, and I'm going to admit that I don't think we do a great job here. So we want, you know, we don't want a lawyer self-employed, you know, self-employed lawyer to be in the traditional sector. I don't know quite how to, you know, parameter, I, I don't quite how to proxy that in the data. So we're just gonna say anyone who's got less than high school, we're just gonna, and self-employed or unpaid family, we're gonna call them traditional sector workers. And anyone who's not, we're gonna call them. It's not, it's not perfect. But if you look at the hours here, so this is actually kind of informative for, for like, you know, the hours in the aggregate. Look at the poorest countries. People in the traditional sector work quite a bit less than people in the modern sector. And so this is, um, you know, this is largely driven by agriculture where hours are, are lower. Um, as you get richer and richer, you still see a gap, although the gaps close. Let me just show you another thing, which again, is nothing new here, but I just want to say it for completeness. This is the share of all people that are in these sectors. So two thirds of all people in the poorest country are in the traditional sector. And so their hours are largely driven by this, this 35 right here. As you move into the middle and rich countries, you get this sector just becomes less and less relevant. And so basically the hours are going to look more and more like the modern sector hours. And so kind of why this matters is just at a mechanical level. Suppose you're in a poor country and then you say, hey, what happens when you move into the middle of the income distribution? Hours are actually going to kind of rise just mechanically here, because you're moving from this low hours sector into this high hours sector. Um, as you move from the middle of the income distribution to the rich, you know, you're kind of not very much in the, in the traditional sector. So you're mostly kind of declining hours because hours fall in this, in this wage sector. So that's kind of just like a, a heuristic story about how this model is gonna get a kind of a hump in the, in the intensive margin. It's all gonna be about moving from this traditional to this modern sector. Um, I'll say a little bit about these parameters. The fixed cost is kind of twice as high or a little bit more than twice as high in the poor as the rich country. Um, I don't think that's crazy. I think commuting costs are, you know, lower. I don't know if you can map exactly into this. Marcus Posky has a paper that says search costs are lower. We've already talked about, um, you know, household duties for, through fertility would be lower. Um, richer countries are going to be kind of you know, like maybe a little bit more than three times as productive in the traditional sector. There's pretty substantial decreasing returns to this sector. This curvature of disutility in that uh, McCurdy preference is 0.45. If you if you into frisch elasticity, that's not that's not far aligned with what what studies argue the frisch elasticity is. And the curvature of consumption. This is this power on consumption. This is what governs the income effect in this model. And if this is one, you're at like log utility, there's no income effect in, or, or, or there's always an income effect. Income effect and substitution effects always cancel out. And so this 1.2 says you, there's an income effect that's stronger than substitution, but it's not, it's not kind of crazy either. Um, the modern sector productivity in the poor country is 0.08 for a comparison. It's normalized to one in the richest country. So it's like richest countries are 12 times as productive or I don't know exactly in my head, 11 times as productive in the modern sector. Let me, let me skip this. So let me show you some pictures on model fit and then we'll do some decomposition exercises. So I have two, I have eight minutes, is that right? Eight minutes, okay. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically, we've calibrated this model to match kind of the poorest and the richest. We're going to just assume that like patterns are, are, are basically completely linear in the productivity and the fixed cost. And then we already showed you that the taxes are piece, piecewise linear. Um, so this is, this is not like, you know, you should be impressed with this. This is just, you know, we match ours and the richest and poor countries. I'm just showing you this graph to say, you know, we did our due diligence. This dark uh, triangle in the middle shows that's a target. The red circles show that that's the average for the, the, the country income group. So we, you know, we target the poorest and the richest. The middle is about right here. Um, Kind of more interesting, we target the employment rates in the rich and poor and hours per worker in the rich and poor, but we actually get kind of this model gets the curvature right. And it gets the curvature right um, kind of for a number of reasons, but the, the employment rate here, the way it gets this kind of decline followed by increase in, um, in the employment rate, that's kind of coming almost entirely from the decreasing uh, fixed cost the fact that this U-bar thing decreases with development. And so as U-bar decreases with development, um, what happens is people, people as things get real rich and rich, richer, they, they enter back into the labor force. Um, as you're going from the poorest countries into the middle, there's all sorts of things happening. There's income effects, but, but mostly what's happening is you're moving out of that traditional sector that has no fixed costs. So kind of most of the household members work to the modern sector that has a lot of fixed costs. And so these households basically, the household head says, wait a minute here, there's this fixed cost now. It's true that the modern sector is productive, but now let's, let's cut back on who's working. So a lot of the decline in employment because of the fact that people are moving into the modern sector as you move in this, this part of the range. The hours per worker is kind of flat and decreasing in the rich countries. I already kind of talked about why that is. That's this here you're kind of moving, things are flat as you move out of the um, traditional sector, but then hours are higher conditional on work for people in the modern sector. So you kind of get this, this, you know, this flat part here. And then they're decreasing here because kind of most people are in the modern sector. And then, you know, remember there's income effects here. So we're all getting richer. When we're getting richer, we, we want to cut down on our hours. This is the fit of the traditional sector. Um, we get it kind of exactly right. Here's a place where we do, and we didn't target, we didn't target too much here. Here's a place where we don't do that well. Still, it kind of doesn't matter that much. So I've talked about the difference between the traditional and the, and the modern. You know, we get that the traditional sector works less than the modern. As you're, um, as you're getting richer and richer, you're moving from this low hour sector into this richer one. As you get down to the, you know, the kind of the richest countries in the world, most people are in the modern sector here. So we get like the traditional sector in England and France and all that pretty wrong. I'm not sure we're measuring that correctly to begin with. That's what I was trying to say to Michael a few moments ago. And then um, there's hardly anyone in that sector in the richest countries. So I doubt that makes too much of a difference. So, but anyways, that's full disclosure. We don't, we don't quite get that right. Um, what we do get right and we don't target at all is this within country slopes that I showed earlier on. So in these within country slopes, you get negative slopes. And so the richer people work less for most of the income distribution. And the model says it kind of flattens out and even goes positive for the richer countries. Why does the model do that? Um, here, it turns out it's largely the tax and transfer systems that's coming in. So when you're poor, you get a negative slope because there's income effects. Richer people just are the richer, they wanna work less. There's always those income effects, but when you get into the richest part of the income distribution, there's these transfers now, and they get bigger and bigger. As you get richer and richer, there's pretty sizable transfers here. And that, in, that transfer itself is an income effect. You get money for nothing, and it's a bigger, it's a bigger uh, income effect, if you will, for the low income than the high income people. The low income people get money for nothing depresses their hours. High income people, yeah, it's money, but it's not as much as, you know, it's not that much relative to their total income. So it doesn't depress their hours as much. And so that's how you get this kind of increasing, um, increasing with development and then end up getting positive slopes at the end. Sean, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So David can ask a question. So I'm trying to understand the, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, figures. 
So yeah. here, the within countries, the main variation is mainly driven by the uh, productivity difference uh, between families. Is that right? So across countries, you mean as you move? From I mean, within country, country here, you just share within countries. Oh yeah, within within countries, all about that Z thing. Yeah, Z, and, 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 and across and, countries, the mainly driven by uh, A. It's the AM, the AT, the AM yeah. fast rises faster than the AT. But then the taxes and yeah, transfer and the tax, are yeah. increasing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And then and then kind of I'm kind of I'm kind of just stating the result. But if you want to know what explains this, the answer is the the um the taxes. So in my last couple of minutes, let me show you a decomposition. And there's many ways you can decompose this. I wish I had budgeted my time better so I'd have more time to go through this, but a couple of minutes should be okay. I'm gonna start from the average low income country and says, okay, we take like Ghana. So the first thing we're gonna do is gonna say, all right, just imagine that only AM and AT increase and nothing else. Okay, so we're not gonna have taxes and transfers. We're not gonna change the like fixed cost of working in the modern sector. And so this is gonna be like, imagine Ghana kind of had the same structure and tax systems that it has now, but we're gonna make it as rich as Germany, how would its hours differ? We can do the same thing where you say, take Ghana, but give it the tax and transfer system of Germany. Oh, but keep it as poor as it, as it is now. That's the second thing. And the third thing for completeness, although it's not that interesting, as you could say, make Ghana just as, just as poor and, and untaxed as it is now, but let's just have this decline in the fixed cost of working. Um, and when you can, you can see how hours vary. So this will be, I guess, be my, my last slide then since I've run out of time. So basically what we're, we're, we're gonna do in all of these things is we're gonna say, what would the hours differences look like? And so here's the model, which matches the data by construction. You know, there's this kind of nine hour difference. I guess I said 10 in the intro, I got it wrong. Nine hours separating rich and poor countries. Um, and then basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you um, what happens when there's only income effects. And then to isolate how important the structural change is, I'm going to show you first when we, ref we refuse to allow anyone in the model to switch sectors. So this is like this first row, it says make, make Ghana just as rich as Germany, but don't allow them to switch sectors. There's no kind of structural change. How many hours would, would they work? Well, the answer is five hours less. And so five hours less, that's like purely an income effect or close to purely an income effect. That explains about 60% of the nine hours that's in the data. Okay, but then when you say, all right, let the Ghanaians switch sectors, what do they wanna do now when we make, make them as rich as Germany? They wanna get the heck out of that traditional sector and into the modern sector. And then remember the modern sector is now taxed. So, oh, we gotta pay tax to the modern sector. We don't like that. Oh, and now there's a fixed cost too. So they end up cutting their hours down to 17 hours a week for a difference of 11. So that model actually explains 123% of the data. So it's like, we over, you know, it's like you over predict the decline in the data. Um, taxes and transfers. So suppose you take, in my example, Ghana, you say, let's give it the tax and transfer system of Germany and have nobody switch sectors. How many fewer hours would they work if we tax them and give them more transfers? The answer is only two. So taxes and transfers in the end just aren't that quantitatively important. And I can just tell you, we've done a lot of weight. We've tortured the model in many ways. The model keeps confessing that taxes alone just aren't that big of a deal. The magnitudes of the tax differences going from, you know, if taxes went from 1% to 99%, you get a lot of action here. But going from tax rates of, you know, 15% to, to like 30%, it just is not quantitatively very important. So that explains 22% of the data. Problem is when you have, you allow people to sort across sectors, what do they do? Well, they, you start, to, you go to the Ghana and you start taxing the modern sector a lot. They go into the traditional sector again. So structural change almost like negates the effect of, of taxes. The final thing is lower fixed costs. This actually goes in the wrong way because if you say take a poor country, lower the fixed cost of work, what do they do? They work more. And so then that explains negative, you know, neg you know negative, I guess in this first thing, 40% of the data. So you basically take a pure income effect of 60%. You add on sectoral reallocation, you get to more than 100% of the data. And then these lower fixed costs take you back within spitting distance. Taxes and transfers are kind of almost irrelevant here. Tax and transfers are mostly important. And I have graphs to back it up, but I, I ran out of time. They're mostly important for that within country pattern. 
So I have various ca alternative calibrations where we shut off income effects. Um, uh, we, we do stone Geary preferences, an alternative model of income effects. They actually explain the data just as well as the model we wrote down today. I can't really tell difference between that and these Bopart Cressel things. Um, so that's it. I'm sorry I've gone over my time allotment. This paper was supposed to be a quantitative model to try to understand the, the, the reasons for the decline in hours and, the, and all the patterns beneath the surface of the decline in hours. We still think income effects are the main, uh, the main force behind these decline in hours. It's an income effect always a residual, but it's just very hard to match the data without a strong residual. Tax and transfer systems are probably very important for within country elasticities are probably not very important for explaining the poorest and the richest differences in hours. And structural change is kind of a nuanced story which affects, affects certainly to the decline in hours, but it, it's kind of pretty important for understanding these intensive and extensive margin um, patterns, we think. So um, yeah, Kenneth. Can you are Go ahead, Helen. Yeah, uh, when, when, when you look at your cross country graphs, perhaps we could, we could look at one. Um, yeah. What we see is these crosses or, or dots, right? Now, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. now um, I'm, I'm wondering, see when we look at all these dots all these dots visually give us the same information that is they're all equal but i'm wondering whether or not that's really the way that this should be interpreted because some of these dots are for very small countries trivially small countries yeah. when you compare them to some very huge countries so i'm yeah. wondering whether or not we should be thinking about somehow weighting by size. size. Size is all taken out of this. So you it miss is. economies of scale, but you, you, you also miss the, 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 the sort of the very important, to my mind, uh, visualization that we should get that yeah. some countries are more important than the world economy than others just because of their size. And yep. maybe that should be reflected in these pictures too uh, you could you could do it with uh, uh bubbles around Bubble, the, yeah. the, the the points of course and you could also incorporate that in the matching algorithm that you use you take uh, you know the square roots of the uh of the size of the country uh, yeah. uh population nominal gdp probably better yeah yeah i i um I agree. I mean, let me let me make let me defend myself by saying that India and China are not here because I whenever I see a graph that has India and China plus other countries, you, you kind of they're just so much bigger than anything we'd have on here. You know, Peru is thirty million people, Ecuador is probably thirty million. These are a billion. So um, we did in the other paper, we didn't do that bubble graph, but we did the average. In the, among the poorest countries and average among the riches. And we tried to do like, you know, you could do a test of the differences in means and say, what are the chances that just by coincidence with these countries, we would see, you know, we would see such a difference. And when you wait there, you didn't get a difference. You still got that. In our other paper, I'm almost certain it's, it's 10 hours a week difference. I didn't just pull that. You get something very close to that 10 hours a week difference between the poorest group and the richest countries. Um, I think it's nine in what we did before because for some of the within country stuff, we didn't have the data. So we dropped a few of these countries somehow get to nine. But as a visual thing, making the graph with the bubbles would be a good idea. And I don't remember if we've ever done that bubble graph. I did that for some industry stuff and like what looked like not a correlation was one once you did the bubbles. And so this one, this one is like the opposite. It looks like there's a pattern, but it, it's, it's possible there isn't. But yeah, it, but when we, when we did a weighted difference of mean, weighted correlation, you still found something very similar. But yeah. I, I agree with you, yeah. Also related, you see, there's a certain sparseness amongst the poor countries compared to the rich countries too. When you just yeah. look at this picture, uh, which, you know, yeah. could be, it could the say something about. 
Yeah, like like this KHM, that's Cambodia. Um, Vietnam, I think, is hidden in here. Vietnam. So then I don't, you know, the, the spar, okay, the sp I could say lots of things. The sparseness, you know, on the one hand, there's not that many of these poor countries. On the other hand, um, you know, we insisted that these, like we defined in our, in our previous paper, the, a core country to be one that just had certain stringent criteria that allowed comparable, you know, just allowed them to be compared and, you know, measured in the same way across countries. So it's not that we could change the surveys. We were stuck with the surveys that we had. Um, but we, we, in the end, you know, did, did most of our analysis just using the core country where we were the most confident that things were measured in the, in the same way. And in the end, you just, you know, you don't have a, you don't have that many, you don't have many low income countries in the data. Yeah. I wish I, I think had. What you can do is you, you can remove unpaid family workers from your definition of employment, just as a, robustness check, because I think you might see much lower levels of um, employment and also hours uh, worked. So. Those guys work a lot of hours though, right? I mean, I in, in another comparison we did for a different project, we looked at average hour among the unpaid guys and they were they were working a lot of hours. Yeah, I don't I don't know, like what's what's the ILO thinking? Is the ILO, maybe I just understood, is the ILO saying we shouldn't have those guys in the in the employed, or you're saying that in rich countries they don't have it, but in poor countries they do in the ILO. Yeah, so I think the ILO says that you should include them in low and middle income countries, but for, I think the definition of work and employment is different in high income countries. That's, that's yeah. why if you're comparing across countries, it's a bit of a problem. I think that's why you've got really high rates of employment in places like Cambodia and Vietnam, because it includes those people in the definition yeah. of work. So anyway, it's just yeah. a thought that maybe remove those people um from your definition yeah. of employment and see see how things look yeah we could right. yeah, we could yep so before we go any forward um so the, i'll have to close the meeting formally but please feel free to stick around and ask david questions if he's yeah available yeah i'm um, available so, yeah all right perfect sean has a question sean do you mind if i go first it'll be a short yeah, one. yeah thanks uh, david for sharing us the interesting findings so yeah. here i think your result remind uh, remind me uh, uh a paper written by Edward Prescott, I think about 15 years ago. Yeah. So compare Europe and America. So I think the main finding yeah. of uh, his main finding is about the uh, difference in the tax rate and yeah. uh, so, um, can explain a lot about uh, the difference between Europe and America. But yeah. here, I think you, your finding is a little bit different, right? So your, dif your finding is a tax regime just can explain this uh, within country variation. So right. uh, I don't know whether you do want to reconcile both uh, 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 your finding and uh, and his findings. So that's a great a great comment. I mean, I think in general there's a it's more than Ed's paper. Like Alex and Nicola have a restud paper talking about women's hours across European countries. So not, not men, but there's a huge variation in, among how much women work. In Italy, women work hardly at all. Um, other countries, I'm blanking now. I think France, women work a lot. Germany's kind of in the middle. The, um, they argue that tax and transfer systems can explain a lot of that variation. Actually, Italy remains puzzling, but, but a lot of the variation can be explained by tax and transfer systems. And I think of like the, like the way to reconcile those two is that there are certainly income differences between income and, you know, US is richer than, than you know, it's, I don't know, it's 20%, France is like 80% as rich as the US or maybe even, it's even 75% as rich as the US. But there, the, the differences in income among those countries are modest and the differences in tax and transfer systems are actually pretty substantial within those rich countries. It's kind of almost the opposite when you go to the, you go to the, you know, France is 75% as rich as the US. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is like, you know, two or 3% as rich as the US. So there's like just massive, massive income differences. And then there are differences in the tax and transfer systems. But like what, I guess like what our paper is arguing is that those income differences between the richest and the poorest just dwarf, just dwarf in importance, the differences in the tax regimes basically. So I, I don't think there's anything inconsistent. Yeah. Is it, uh, David, actually, um, I, 
is it possible that the uh, the tax effects more relevant on the uh, intensive margin compared to the extensive margin? And then you yeah. you happen to find most of the drop happened it on the extensive margin instead of the intensive margin. If that's the case, then I can explain why you have a smaller share of the uh, effect coming from the tax and transfers. Yeah, it the so the the extensive margin just mechanically explains most of how you move from the poorest into the middle of the income distribution. There, the extensive margin is just really, really important. Our model squares that by that's when people are moving out of self-employed self, you know, self -employed farming into wage work. And then it's just like, hey, there's this fixed cost. A bunch of people are going to drop out. Um, and then you know, most of the movement on hours comes from the intensive margin as you go from the middle income to the rich. And yeah, you, like you say, an income effect. Okay, I mean, you didn't say that. So, all right, like you said, a tax, a tax and transfer systems definitely do bind a lot in that part. You see, tax and transfers. So, so the part of the data that they're the most informative about is that part. Um, still, over that range, you also have huge differences in income. But yeah, it would be interesting to do a. Your, your comment makes me think we should do a, a different kind of complementary. Um, decomposition kind of where we start at the middle and say, let's explain how you go from the middle of the income to the richest. Cause there's a different explanation. Taxes, I think are actually, like you said, that's the place where they are important. Are they important when you go from Africa to the middle of the income distribution? Not really just cause there's hardly any, hardly any taxes in either one. And there's, there's huge movements along the extensive margin. So, but that would be interesting to highlight its role you know where it where it is relevant. Um, so yeah, and I also, think we, yeah, and also there's a progressivity in the in the tax rates, and then so if you yeah. think about that, and on intensive margin, then the effect of tax would it will be non-linear. Yeah, yeah, you're right, and we, I mean, like, yeah, we, we have to have some re. You know, you explain bells and whistles. There has to be some reason to put it in there. So so that's we should do experiments with the progressivity. Mm relative to just take the average tax and call that the labor tax on everybody. Mm. Um, and I think that actually would be a useful exercise. That actually would be a useful exercise to then, because it, it would help comparing the, not the progressivity with the, just everybody pays the average labor tax. That would, that would help flush out what the progressivity does. And yeah, I think that it comes in as you get to that rich part of the income distribution. I think that it's true that it probably plays a role there. Um, that, that would affect the intensive margin. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it would ex affect the extensive margin too, but yeah, I agree with you. It'd be mostly the intensive margin there. Yeah, we can do that. That's a good comment. But a quick question. Um, so controlling for the fixed costs that you talk about, um, yeah. I see that you are modeling uh, in the traditional sector, you're modeling, uh, you know, the production function as decreasing returns to hours worked. Yeah. I'm yep. trying to understand how potent that channel in itself is in explaining yeah. the hours worked because the two assumptions that are going side by side, A, yeah. you have decreasing returns in traditional sector. B, yep. as you develop further, the size of the traditional sector is decreasing. So I can understand yep. that that assumption alone explains the hours worked graph, no? Because initially... Yeah. You were saying why, what explains why you don't, why you're not working a lot in poorer countries. And I see why that's the case. And yep, then yep. I also see why hours mechanically increase when you get more developed. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Um, so we, we've been emailing all week about alternative, you know, on the one hand, I like the decomposition we did because it's simple, at least it's simple relative to other alternatives. On the one hand, structural change is not really there. You know, it's just this, remember how we said, one of the things we said is, well, let's have an income effect, but let's not allow people to switch sector. I've never really been comfortable from that because it, well, for one thing you're saying, let's go off, you know, it's restrict somebody's choices in equilibrium, which is strange. But the other thing is just like you said, you're not giving any insight at all about those two features that you said, plus a third, which is the, as you move into the modern sector, now you have to pay taxes. So that kind of interacts with taxes. And then there's these different forces. So, so we're gonna do a bunch of, but they're not, you know, they're not ready yet, but we're working on a bunch of alternative ones where you say, 
re-estimate the model, but make row one. So you just have constant returns to scale in the traditional Exactly, sector. exactly what I was about to say. Just, just see what's the difference by yeah. relaxing the assumption that, uh, you know, that's decreasing returns to scale. Yeah. So I know, I know what happens in various things like that. It's very, very hard to get anyone working few hours when they're really poor, unless you have that row thing, basically, because you, you have, you're desperately poor. There's no fixed cost. You know, you say grandma, me, my wife, everybody's out there working and then we're all desperate. So let's work tons of hours. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like hopeless to match the data without the row thing. Mm. And it is, so the second thing we're going to do is make the fixed cost be this restrict the fixed cost to be exactly the same in the modern and traditional sector. Yep. So still, you know, do what everybody does in this literature. There's no direct evidence on a fixed cost, pick the fixed cost to get, I don't know, somebody, you know, the poor country's employment rate, but then you're going to get none of the channel where now that we move into the rich countries, you have people saying, oh, fixed cost. All right, let's pull some of our members back and cut back on the extensive margin. Yeah. So, but, but that, that, um, yeah. So, and then we're going to do another one where you basically say, assume that everybody pays taxes, not just the modern sector. And that's, you know, blatantly unrealistic, but it's, um, it's useful to say how important is that channel. And I, and I don't know that last channel that, that could be kind of, if that's very unimportant, my gut would be to just, you know, just have everybody pay taxes, even even that if it's unrealistic, just because if it doesn't matter that much, then we can take people's attention. Because there's there's so many different things that the traditional sector, you know, it's like three different ways it, it differs from the modern sector. And I, yeah, I, anyways, it's a great comment. It's exactly what we're working on now. And um, yeah, I wish I had results already, although I budgeted my time so badly in this talk, I probably would have, I probably would have run out of time anyways, but if we're working on it. David, uh, a general observation that, you know, what you're trying to explain is the cross-sectional differences across country. Yeah, right? yeah. And your model in some way is about structural transformation, which is more like a dynamic process, right? So yeah, I, see I think it's kind of the same. Yeah, you think so? Because, well, I, I mean, there's, there's clearly different, you know, like 300 years ago, everybody was poor. You know, there was nobody to catch up to. So for certain questions, like how fast are you catching up to the frontier? England in 1700 and, you know, I don't know, Ecuador today were very, very different, you know, but for this, I don't know. I, I kind of think it's the same basic forces. I, I don't know if there's a catch up to the rest of the world. Here it's like, yeah, I never do open economy models, but here you, you could kind of ignore the rest of the world and just say, hey, this is, this economy is just plugging along on its own. So we're kind of going for the common theme that, um, and that graphic at the beginning was supposed to, um, was supposed to kind of capture the, the similarities between the long run over time and the cross country today. Michael, if you really want to see some lousy data, there's, there's time series on hours that like, I, I'm, I'm blanking on, on who does this. It's like Madison or something going back to, it's a bunch of European countries going back to the late, like mid to late 1800s. But, and Timo and Per Crisell and their paper cite those data, but those data are terrible. Like, like they don't have data on hours per worker for any European country. And so, and, and so what do they do? They just use England. So basically you can download data from dozens of European countries and you know what you're looking at? England, basically. I, it's just like, I, so I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I get it. It's hard to get data from a bunch of countries in 1865, but we should just not have a, you know, we should just not put that on the graph. Like I put this, you know, this thing because Valerie, my colleague at UCSD was extremely careful as, you know, to the extent possible, she, she made these things comparable. If you look in the Bopart and Crisell, you see all these beautiful things, all these European countries move in tandem. You know why? It's England. It's just England with a different initial condition. And I, I just, we told that they're not data guys, you know, so they, they, they're writing a model. They just need some figure one to motivate their, are we still recording? Maybe I should, I love these guys, by the way. I just, I'm just saying, you, you publish something in the JP, then a bunch of grad students look at it. So, oh, I guess that's the reality. But if you push, you push those data, it's, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just, it's a stack of cards, you know, it just all comes down. There's just not good hours data from, you know, the like late 19th century outside of like England. Yeah. 
Also, David, uh, one trivial question, but um, if you if you look at the extensive margin, you had like a hump in it, right? But and you yeah. said it's is there yeah, for the both males one, and yeah. females, right? Yeah. This one, there, yeah, yep. yep. Um, so that kind of like you know, if you if you go back to the Claudia Goldin you hypothesis, right? It's kind of yep. contradictory, right? I mean. What's her oh, hypothesis? Sorry, she. So her she point is, as as countries become richer, females actually withdraw from the labor market, multiple yeah. reasons, technology and all that. But as countries become richer and richer and richer, and they're extremely rich, then they start working again. Yeah. So in some way, it's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Well, so this is the so this would be the extensive margin. So if you do this uh, for females, they're not a male and female. I mean, men always kind of work more than women, but they're not that different in the poorest countries. So, mm. so it is kind of like in our model. You know, there's no okay. fixed cost. We all go work. Women get are much lower here in the middle of the income distribution. So, th so that is kind of consistent. Um, so there's just these very massive drops for women, and then they have a much sharper increase as you get richer and richer. So it's not that it's not that they're exactly the same. It's just that, like I kept saying, well, let's just drop the women because I don't want, I don't know why there's this uptick and I don't want to do fixed costs which decline over. The only reason we need fixed costs which decline with development is to get this uptick. Otherwise, people just say, oh, let's get the hell out of here. There's these fixed costs. We're richer, so you need that. But that but you do see it for men, and we revisited the data this week. You definitely see an uptick. You definitely see this big trend. It's just. It is, so I think Claudia is right. It is much more dramatic for women than men. Yeah. But it's not that men labor supply is just, I, I don't, it's not that it's so boring. There's nothing to say. There's that decline there too. Yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, I'll bring it to a close. Cool. Thank you so Thanks much, so David, much for, for making me. time. Yeah, it was, My pleasure. It was Real useful, real useful comments. It was really helpful as we as we're working on this uh, as we're working on this project. So I really really appreciate all the comments from everybody. It was fascinating, and we hope to see this in print soon. So and yeah, hopefully well, we'll get you over the next time we are doing this. That sounds like fun. If I do an Australia trip, for sure I'll come out yeah. and visit. You guys are in Perth, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a friend of mine in um, grad school, her, my roommate, her parents were from South Africa, but they moved to Perth. So she, uh -huh. she, she, Martine Mariotti, I don't know, does she ever come visit you? She's at, um, in Canberra. Where would you be employed if you're in Canberra? ANU. ANU, exactly. I don't, I'm, I'm very tired. I know ANU, I'm just, it's mm. late. So she goes from <laughs> ANU to Perth and said, oh, if you come to Australia, we'll go to Perth. So if I, if I come to Australia, I'll come to Perth for sure. Yeah. Right? It'd, be, oh. it'd be great. We'll wait for it. Okay. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye. Cheers. Bye.